Today is Wednesday, June 5th, and this is a Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. Today, we are joined by Akio Masumura, the former Special Advisor to the United Nations Development Program, the Founder and Secretary General of the Global Forum of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders for Human Survival, and the Secretary General of the 1992 Parliamentary Earth Summit Conference in Rio de Janeiro. We are also joined by Chiho Koniko, a Fairwinds Energy Education Board member, and Arnie Gunderson, Fairwinds Chief Engineer. Thank you all for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for inviting me here first time (laughs) in Vermont. (laughs) Yes, thank you. Today's discussion will focus on how the accident of Fukushima Daiichi continues to affect the people in Japan. We will explore the efforts made by Tokyo Electric and the Japanese government in the cleanup effort. At the end of our conversation, we're going to take a moment to talk about how Fairwinds listeners can help those affected. There was a a, a famous quote from a a Japanese farmer when the accident happened. He said, "Um, I am fighting a dragon I cannot see. And I think that uh, was true then, and, and it's true now. The, um, the people in the prefecture especially, but then also the people in Japan, received very high radiation exposures, higher than the IAEA is willing to discuss. Um, the, um, the, the evidence is, is clearly in that the accident released three times more radiation in the form of noble gases from, than, than compared to Chernobyl and uh, roughly the same amount of um, uh, cesium as, uh, as Chernobyl did. So this is a world-class uh, event uh, that has been downplayed by the uh, Japanese government. So you've got a latency period of five to 10 years, and, and in some cases 30 years, for, for cancers to develop, which gets me back to fighting the dragon you cannot see. Um, these people have been exposed. We've had guests on the program that talk about the taste of radiation and uh, uh, the smell of radiation. Um, well, in, in those circumstances, the exposures were extraordinarily high, and um, you have to assume that uh, there's an increased probability of cancer. So that's where we're at now. People have to go to bed every night wondering if it's going to be them or the person in the house next to them. Well, uh, uh, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to thanks to Annie and Maggie for your great contribution to my country, Japan, in Fukushima. And uh, Annie and Helen Kadikot are two are most well-known to Japanese people. Now, because I am a Japanese, I live in abroad 40 years, I'm frustrated by the lack of sense of emergency crisis at Fukushima. That's why I, I'm making an effort to increase public awareness uh, and particularly political leaders to understand the situation, what are you talking about? And I'd like to explain more de- later. What role are the IAEA and the Japanese government taking in the continuing management of this crisis? Are they acting with enough urgency to protect the people of Japan? Well, number one, uh, actually there are several political reasons. Uh, since I know UN system, IAEA is primary UN agencies, but primarily they are promoting uh, energy peace for nuclear power plant. But this time accident, it's a different function from IAEA. But overall, uh, political leader Japan and America as well underestimate the situation, what happening at Fukushima now. And uh, this is a huge, huge uh, issue the human being never faced. And also this conse- consequences of this radiation, which affect thousand years and how do you take responsible to our thousand years for descendant? With the IAEA's primary objective being promotion of nuclear power around the world, is it not a conflict of interest to have them also be responsible for measuring the levels of radioactivity after the accident at Fukushima Daiichi? The IAEA um, does two things. 
Um, the, the first is uh, weapons proliferation. Um, you know, they go into countries where um, uh, people have promised not to make bombs to make sure that they are abiding by that promise. 95% of the uh, people who work for IAEA are involved in weapons proliferation. Only 5% are involved in nuclear power. The IAEA's charter, charter number two, second item on the list, is to promote nuclear power. So while different media groups call it um, the, the UN watchdog, uh, in fact, they're the UN lapdog, and they um, are, are knowingly chartered by uh, the agencies that, that, that fund the UN and the companies behind them to promote nuclear power, not to protect the public. So I think when you, when you hear of an IAEA report out there, you've got to go back to that very fundamental foundation piece that these guys are promoters and they're not regulators. Does that prioritizing of promotion end up having a negative impact on the public? Uh, I didn't think. No. Well, first off, you know, the country was devastated by a, a, a tsunami that, uh, that killed 22,000 people. Um, you know, we have our 9-11 in the United States that killed 3,000 people. And, and they say we have got our 3-11, uh, which killed, uh, you know, seven times more than, uh, uh, than, than yours. So that alone is psychologically devastating to a country. Then on top of that, the next day a nuclear plant blew up, and the next day another nuclear plant blew up, and the next day another nuclear plant blew up. Um, the, uh, the, the trauma from the earthquake is compounded by the fact that now 160,000 people can't get back to their homes, not because they're destroyed in the tsunami, but because there's so much radiation that they're not allowed back home yet. You know, think about it. You, we're now 26 months out. And, uh, and people cannot go back to the home they used to live in. Um, it's, it's devastating emotionally to the families. You know, on top of that, while they were home, because the Japanese didn't evacuate soon enough, um, you know, they, they were exposed to high levels of radiation and they have to live with the question, you know, am I gonna get a cancer in five or 10 years? It has to be gnawing at them. Are we not already seeing reports of cysts on the thyroid glands of children throughout the prefecture of Fukushima as well as the rest of Japan? Children already had um, thyroid cancer removed, um, so and seven more suspected of having uh, thyroid cancer, just uh, among 38,000 children. So, you know, they are testing more and more children, but the first uh, uh, study on, you know, already showed that the three confirmed cancer. So that's quite alarming. But then uh, what's more concerning is the fact that the, um, even today, you know, I just heard on the radio that the UN officially concluded that the, um, the cancer derived from Fukushima Daiichi accident will not be increased. I mean, the, there, will be, there won't be increased cancer in Japan because of the accident. That was today's report. And I think that really, um, compounds the, the problem, and, and especially psychologically da da uh, damaging to people living in the area because they know people are getting sick. They know they're sick. They know people are dying, and yet the world has written them off, in a sense, that you know, if, it, if they get sick, well, don't blame the accident. It's your fault. And that's, that's what bothers me the most. This was uh, already happened before case after Chernobyl accident. That within five years, UN, IAEA, uh, conclude the same conclusion that there was no serious case for children. But after five years, ten years, and now there are so many children suffered from thyroid. So having cardiac said, uh, this doesn't appear until five years, ten years. So it is irresponsible that a UN conclude yeah. at this point now. The, the, the secrets and the assumptions, you know, I, I've been saying that since the accident began. Um, two days after the accident, a prominent pro-nuclear doctor uh, was out there saying, don't worry, nobody's going to get a cancer. 
And then he published what he claims to be a scientific story, which, which supports something that he came to very unscientifically. That's how the industry works. It's important for the industry to say, you know, don't worry, there's not going to be 100,000 cancers. We need to sell you another nuclear plant. Um, and, and the financial pressures uh, within Japan and within the world to downplay the significance of this accident are absolutely enormous. And that's why Fairwinds is doing what we're doing. You know, we're trying to uh, let the people of Japan know that that when they feel sick, it's not in their head. This is a real physical problem caused by that accident. What is the status of nuclear power right now in Japan? Is it still being viewed as a viable form of energy? And are plants still being sold to other countries around the world? Well, current government, Liberal Democratic Party, <clears throat> Who, who the one introduced and promoted uh, this nuclear power plant 40, 50 years ago. Now they come back the government power. So they are uh, exporting a nuclear power plant to Turkey or Vietnam or other countries. You know, and the other part of the status is that within Japan, there, there were um, 20, 52 nuclear power plants or 54 nuclear power plants. Yeah. Well, Fukushima, the H-1, 2, 3, 4 are never going to come back, so there's, they're down to 50. But um, also um, Daiichi 5 and 6 um, are, are also in that same category, so now we're down to 48. And um, th they also had um, uh, Kashibazaki uh, Karariwa has 7, and they discovered that that's right on an earthquake fault. So what we're seeing is um, uh, quite a few of the 50 uh, nuclear plants in Japan likely will uh, be unable to start up, even if the ruling party um, chooses to try to make them start up. Um, too many of these plants were sited on or near active fault lines. And now with the new regulator, um, they finally have somebody with a spine who is telling these these plants that uh, you can't operate because you're sitting on an earthquake zone. The electric companies are barking at that uh, scientific uh, approach, right? And they recently, um, I guess, um, I can't remember which electric company, but recently there was the um, official complaint from the electric company about the findings by the uh, uh, commission. Yeah, what happens is that um, you know, there's a lot of money on the line, and you can buy a lot of lawyers and a lot of experts to defend your case. And that's exactly what's happening. The electric companies don't want to lose the asset and, um, and are willing to, to find an, a, a, a supposed expert who will tell them that, uh, don't worry, be happy, there's no, there's no danger here. That's exactly what Tokyo Electric did when they knew they were going to have a tsunami bigger than, uh, bigger than five meters. Uh, they hired experts who made the problem appear to go away until the problem comes. and then, then I, I also I have growing growing concern nowadays. A seismologist reported last week there is a great chance, more than 70% chance, uh, that strong, uh, huge plate-based earthquake may hit Japan or uh, Tokyo area within four years. You these, know, are, these are serious issues, additional issues we have to consider. You know, after the, the big earthquake in Sumatra, uh, which was a 9, um, we forget that a couple of years later there was an 8.5. Um, so we had the 9.3 off of the coast of Japan that caused the tsunami and the, and the uh, Fukushima Daiichi disaster, but when plates move, they move again, right. and um, with that second large movement hasn't come yet. Um, perhaps it never will, and uh, but to bet on that is not a good thing, especially considering how fragile uh, Fukushima Daiichi Unit Three and Unit Four are. And according to calculation of uh, Robert Alvarez, uh, Unit Four contain. Uh, season 137 radiation, uh, 10 times uh, more than Ch Chernobyl accident, about 5,000 times of Hiroshima bomb. 
an entire Hiroshima site, the minimum figure Robert Alvarez calculated, the minimum figure is 85 times than Chernobyl, which represent about 50,000 to 100,000 times of Hiroshima bomb. So you've got an enormous amount of radiation sitting on the roof of a building that's been compromised because it exploded. Um, the, there's, there's no doubt that the building is not as strong as it was. And in fact, there's a bulge at the, at the bottom of a couple of inches uh, uh, called a first mode Euler strut bulge, uh, which is another indication of a seismic problem. Um, we focus on Unit 4 because it has the most and hottest radioactive fuel. But um, to my mind, Unit 3 is just as bad. It, it doesn't have quite as much nuclear fuel in, the, uh, in it, but it's the one that had the most devastating explosion. So from a seismic standpoint, um, it's probably more likely to topple. If Unit 4 were to topple, there's more dose consequence. But either way, it's, it's, a, it, it's really a bad scenario. Uh, you can do two things. You can try to solve it, or you can try to pray that an earthquake doesn't happen. And I think uh, TEPCO's been dragging its feet as far as trying to solve the problem quickly. And also, Annie, uh, I wanted to ask you about recent report of uh, water, contaminated water. There are 280,000 ton uh, at the site of Fukushima. And uh, I'm sure this is increasing issue and a concern of contaminated waters. Yeah, there's, um, what happened is that after the earthquake, the entire Fukushima site dropped one meter, dropped three feet. So in the process, as it drops three feet, that increases the water pressure underneath it, and also the foundations were cracked. So you've got groundwater seeping into the building. The groundwater should be uncontaminated, except the containment is not containing. You know, the, the, the containment has all of these penetrations for pipes and wires to go through. And uh, there's all sorts of rubber gaskets that prevent the containment from leaking. Radiation exposures and the heat and the explosion were so great that the, the, the rubber gaskets are, have failed. Mm -hmm. Now, we knew this in 1982. There's a, there's a report out that says, watch out for these rubber gaskets on the Mark I design because they're prone to fail. Um, and yet we did nothing about it. So we have a containment that is not containing. And all the radiation in that is now running into the buildings where the groundwater is coming in. So we have highly contaminated water growing at a rate of 400 tons a day. Now the Daiichi site is loaded with tanks. If you, if you look at the, the Google Earth pictures of the site, there's, it's a tank farm. It, it's, it's bigger than a refinery as far as the number of tanks they've got there. What really frightens me is twofold. One, they haven't begun to stop the, the, um, the addition of, um, of radioactive water. And two, if there is an earthquake, all those tanks are not seismically qualified. They'll all fail, run into the ocean, and you know the Pacific is a big place, but it's not big enough to handle uh, all that contamination. Well, then, Annie, in the case the you said is it, it might take 40, 50 years more to contain Fukushima. Then, does that mean for another 50 years that uh, we we keep this water contaminated waters at only two years now? 280,000 tons. So what happened in another 40, 50 years? One of, the, one of the plans I proposed back, geez, right at the beginning of the accident, was to build a trench around the plant and fill it with zeolite. Zeolite is a great um, uh, volcanic substance that uh, absorbs cesium really well. So you could basically build a fence around the plant to prevent the radiation from entering the groundwater. Um, I was told by Japanese officials that it's a great idea, but they didn't have the money. And you can't, th th this is, um, Akio mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, that um, th there's uh, the pace at which they're attacking the problem is not sufficient. You can't fight a war on a budget, and, and this, is, uh, this is a war. Um, now the Japanese are talking about freezing the earth. 
bringing in refrigeration units and freezing the earth underneath the reactor. This would be more expensive than what you had suggested early on in the accident. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, and, and you have to keep it up. There are examples of freezing the earth. The Leaning Tower of Pisa was leaning a little bit too far, and they were afraid it was going to topple. And so um, Italian engineers came up with a scheme of freezing the earth, and they, they pushed it back up a little bit so it wouldn't topple. But, but a nuclear plant is huge in comparison to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and you would have to maintain that refrigeration system for you know, 30, 40 years. So it's um, a, a very expensive solution to a, a very serious problem. I have a question um, uh, to Arnie. You know, people living in Fukushima today, there are many people living in uh, fairly contaminated areas, uh, even though those areas are not uh, classified as evacuation zone. But you know, for instance, city of Koryama, which has a uh, population over, I believe, 300,000. And that's a lot of people. And so uh, somebody that I know uh, from that area you know, has a Geiger counter. And this person said that the radiation level uh, is going, has gone up, actually. And even after one year, uh, after, let's say last um, fall, maybe radiation level will start to go up again. How do you explain oh. that? Yeah, there's... Good question. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, um, f first off, the, the, I don't think people should be living in those radiation fields we're experiencing. Um, you know, a, a lot of Japanese are allowed to go back into these areas when the uh, exposures are, uh, are, are five um, uh, millisieverts, which is 500 millirem. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the limit is, is, is 20 millisieverts or, or 2 rem. Um, those numbers are comparable to what, what workers get when they work in a nuclear plant for a year. So we're asking people to assume the risk of, uh, of the exposure of a, of a nuclear worker, but the nuclear worker takes that risk willingly and he's paid for it. Whereas when somebody has to, is forced to go back into their home, there's no, um, there's no risk-reward benefit here. They're not told the risk, and they're not compensated for it. What efforts has the Tokyo Electric Company taken to clean up these contaminated areas? TEPCO seems to view its responsibility as the site. And, um, you know, I, I said when I was in Japan last fall that uh, TEPCO is an operating company. They, they operate nuclear plants, but they're not an engineering company. And to expect the, a company to be able to engineer their way out of a problem like this without the engineering expertise um, is, a, is a real problem. Off-site, the cleanup seems to be uh, under the control of the Japanese government. Um, they're paying contractors. The contractors, um, Asahi Shinbun, has, has shown that the contractors are picking up the contamination, either taking it into the woods or, or dumping it into rivers. Um, as opposed to disposing of it properly. Doesn't that just serve to compound the problem? Yes, it absolutely compounds the problem. The radiation exposures are going up. And what, what you're seeing is a lot of this stuff is getting re-volatilized. Um, it, it, it's in the first couple inches of dust. And when the wind blows, it, it moves into areas that have been previously can, uh, uh, cleaned. So the, the net effect is unless you tackle a broad area all at once, um, the way the Japanese are doing it is, well, I walk on this path, therefore I'll clean this path. But as soon as they've cleaned it, if they haven't cleaned you know, hundreds of meters on either side of it, the contamination will come back. Um, it's, it's a phenomenon we saw at, uh, at Chernobyl as well. What happens there, and this will go on for, for decades, is that as the cesium works its way down into the soil, the roots bring it back up and into the plant structures, and it shows up in the leaves, which then fall on the ground, and the cycle continues. We're seeing that in cedar buds. The, um, the, this, this year's um, uh, outcropping of the cedar pollen was highly contaminated with radiation again. So, so radiation that is trapped in the soil winds up in the buds and then gets re-volatilized. So what we're seeing in all of these uh, uh, areas within Fukushima Prefecture is the revolatiliz revolatilization 
of material that we had um, that the Japanese hoped would remain stable. That's not a good hope. Based on his history, they should have known it's going to move. But I really don't think they're willing to spend the money to solve it. Mm -hmm. you know, I've been saying for for two years now, when I spoke at the press club in, in February of last year, I said this is a half a trillion dollar problem, and um, U.S. dollars. And what that means is that, um, uh, and the Japanese are not uh, accepting that it's a half a trillion dollar problem, because the government wants to sell nuclear plants. And if they all realize they're stuck with a half a trillion dollars in debt, I doubt very much that people would be very willing to fire up another nuclear plant. Wouldn't it be beneficial to have a group of scientists from all different disciplines come together to discuss a plan to clean up the Fukushima Daiichi site? I, I mentioned many times, and I, I also wrote a letter to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, strongly suggest to establish independent international assessment team composed of nuclear scientists, geologists, uh, seism seismologists, environment, all this together to look at the totality picture. Because we are confused by so many scientists saying that I, I only listen to now Annie and Helen. So I, I, I think what do you think, uh, Annie, uh, that idea of independent international assessment team? I think an independent assessment team for, of international experts is critical. And, and I understand that the Japanese government does not want that to happen. Um, uh, the truly independent experts I'm talking to are very concerned about the long-term consequences. And um, the Japanese government just doesn't want that concern to be out there. Well, it is clear that many scientists no longer support nuclear power in Japan. Many still do. Why is that? Uh, a, a newspaper called the Asahi Shinbun um, ran a story about a month ago now. And the headline was 70% of Japanese scientists still uh, support nuclear power. Um, and... Uh, I read that and I said, well, that means that 30% of Japanese scientists don't support nuclear power, which is a, a big number. Well, I, as you uh, go back into the study that they're referring to, it shows that um, before the accident, only 13% um, of Japanese scientists thought nuclear was not safe. And now we're at 30. So the, we, we have almost a 250% increase in the number of Japanese scientists that are concerned about nuclear power. And also, Annie, that uh, I always, whenever I met to political leader in Japan, I'm saying I'm not talking pro or against nuclear power plant, but I'm drawing their attention to the fact of urgency at Fukushima. Uh, and, and therefore, this situation, of course, we know TEPCO alone cannot solve this issue neither. And uh, they know, TEPCO knows, one this night. is beyond their ability and is, capacity. Is this why TEPCO refuses to take ownership over the radiation released by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant? Well, technology is so complicated, I think. That's why not only international independent assessment team, uh, after that, we need some wisdom together. TEPCO, fine. But Bechtel? Uh, or other expertise on the issue, water contaminated issue, or we have to bring head together, wisdom together. You know, there is an international precedent on this, and that was uh, Three Mile Island. The company that owned Three Mile Island, General Public Utilities, um, couldn't do it. They could not correct uh, and, and mitigate the problem. So they brought in a firm, Bechtel, to, uh, to take over the cleanup. They, re they renounced the responsibility, still continue to uh, uh, support it, but uh, the, the uh, TMI cleanup couldn't be done by the utility that caused the accident. So we shouldn't be um, uh, surprised that uh, you know, four reactors that are blown up are in the same, uh, same situation. Um, to expect that TEPCO has the capability of cleaning up the biggest industrial accident in the history of the world is um, there's a little bit um, a little bit of a stretch of the imagination. 
So now, I know that we've talked about a couple possible solutions to clean up the mess of Fukushima Daiichi, and I was wondering if we could discuss a few more. If TEPCO is unable to clean up this mess, and the Japanese government is unwilling to support the cleanup effort in the way that it needs to be supported, what can we do? What I proposed when I was in Tokyo last August was that um, TEPCO should be removed. Um, they just are not competent. And a, a large engineering company uh, should be put in charge. Um, and there are uh, Japanese firms which are outstanding and very large and American firms and European firms that could do it. But um, I, I don't think that's enough. I, I don't think the Japanese people uh, trust any large international organization, just like the UN, uh, to, to replace TEPCO. I think there needs to be a group of independent scientists overseeing the international agency. And um, I'm not suggesting IAEA because they're not independent scientists. Um, but a group of, of Japanese and American and European scientists that the Japanese people trust um, should be the watchdog over this large engineering company that's actually doing the work. You know, whether you're pro-nuclear or anti-nuclear, it's in everybody's best interest to get this site cleaned up. And Tokyo Electric is not cutting the mustard. And then I think American people should understand, eventually this Fukushima disaster, no question will affect your North America as well. So it's, it is not matter issue of the Fukushima now. It is a global security issue as well. Who is paying for the cleanup in Japan right now? Primarily the government. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. <laughs> uh, Tokyo Electric, um, uh, I think there's an expectancy on everybody's part that Tokyo Electric's paying for it, but they're essentially in receivership. I mean, the, they've, been, they've been nationalized by the, by the Japanese government. Um, and now the, the funds, Tep TEPCO lost $7 billion last year, but frankly, that's chump change compared to what the, the, the total liability is exactly. out there. So we're expecting a company with essentially no assets to carry a burden of a half a trillion dollars. Um, so what's happening, though, I think, is that the Japanese government is blaming TEPCO, but they're also not giving TEPCO enough money. So you've got a company that's, that, that's technologically not competent, and you've got a company that may have some better ideas and just isn't getting the money to fund them. So by having an international oversight group, um, you could put pressure on the Japanese government to free up the funds you need um, to, to put the site to sleep. And um, uh, that effort is inadequate, in my opinion. It's clear that the west coast of the United States will be affected by the radiation from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. What assistance has the United States government offered Japan in the face of this formidable challenge? Well, number one, this let, let me clarify. We are facing global disaster, catastrophe, you call it. From that perspective, over 40 years, 50 years, or maybe 100 years, we cannot escape from this fact. So that we have to keep in mind. Now, during 40 years, 50 years, 100 years, this uh, radioactive material or water, contaminated waters, any cases, reach out to your west coast as well. And now, if you are count on Japan, come in Japan, I can assure you now, they do not take serious action. Japanese Prime Minister do not, doesn't have power like your President. Pre Prime Minister is consensus building power, not decision making power. So therefore I like to ask your government, take it to serious consideration to lead this issue and uh, mobilize international community uh, to look at this issue and order together. Otherwise, I don't see any hope for better solution at all. We've been contacted by uh, excellent American firms 
that are absolutely frustrated by their inability to to get into the Japanese market and uh, and offer some great cleanup solutions. So there are Americans chomping at the bit to help, and they are being prohibited by internal constraints within Japan from uh, from from reaching out to help to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But don't you think that the um, U.S. government has a lot of uh, sway over Japanese <coughs> government? So in that sense, mm -hmm. the fact that Japanese government hasn't um, uh, made the move almost suggests that you know that that's uh, a somewhat of a policy on the part of U.S. government as well, no? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I think um, I I I try to avoid uh, any political argument element. I'm making an effort to draw the urgency of this issue to the policy maker, both country Japan and America. If America remain silent, I, I almost sure I tell you, hundred years, uh, uh, ten years from now, many children even in your country may be affected. So, I think now the time to bring wisdom head together to look at this issue to make better solution. Well, I think what Akio said is absolutely right. But uh, I, I think people think that if we get involved, it's an anti-nuclear statement. Wh whether you like nuclear power or not, it's in everybody's best interest to get that site under control. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That seems like it would be common sense. It's exactly. What are the medical and legal ramifications for those who have been displaced and who have become ill since the accident? Chiho, I know you have been to Fukushima recently and met and spoken with many of the residents. Can you tell us a little more about what they are experiencing? So in terms of um, government, government help, in terms of money, for people to, say, relocate, uh, I was in an area called Oguni district of uh, Date City, which is in uh, Fukushima. And uh, this particular uh, district um, was designated as a special uh, sort of a recommend, uh, evacuation recommended uh, uh, spot. Or they call it spot, not zone, because household by house, household uh, got chosen to relocate. And they did get government help uh, to relocate. However, that designation uh, no longer exist. In other words, that whole district is now declassified I as see. a sort of evacuation uh, recommended see. area. Now th and that means uh, the funding uh, from the government for people to relocate uh, stopped coming. Or, so that's, that's, that's what I'm uh, really concerned that, um, you know, this ex expediting um, people this effort to um, pe relocate, I mean, bring people back to Fukushima, th it seems like there is more money put into that effort rather than helping people stay out. So there's so much money uh, in decontamination, scraping, sort of the construction type of work, um, but then not enough money uh, for, you know, just a small so assistance for rent, paying rent or anything like that. There's no money. Once the designation is uh, over, you don't get any money. Is that fair? For those who have been permanently relocated and who will never be able to return to their homes or their farms, what kind of compensation have they received from TEPCO and the Japanese government? Uh, well, the woman from Fukushima, uh, from the uh, village of Kawauchi, which is, uh, was a mandatory evacuation zone for the first, um, I would say, less than a year, but uh, you know, almost up to a year, the entire village was evacuated. And But now, since uh, last year, January 31st, the village was, um, uh, they declared that the uh, village was not safe for people to go back. So some people have chosen to go back to the village, but they, according to her, maybe less than 20% of uh, the villagers have returned to date. Um, anyway, so I asked her how much money she has gotten. And she said that everybody initially got something like um, maybe $10,000 know, across the board. All, everybody got, just, just initially. But after that, she has not seen any payment from anybody. 
So she's part of a class action lawsuit or maybe compensation, um, you know, sort of an action against TEPCO, but she has not seen any money. We have had reports of families being offered as little as $1,600 by TEPCO and the Japanese government when unable to return to their home. It is tragic when people are offered no more than a month's rent or mortgage to replace their whole lives. Having had to buy new furniture in a new place and all the, you know, moving and the stress yeah. and the loss of job. No, I think I'm frustrated to hearing all this economic issue because uh, actually I mentioned to former Prime Minister Hatoyama last year. This is national crisis. How come we can depend on private sectors? Have to have national crisis, total budget, extraordinary budget to prepare, to look at the entire picture. But as Ani said, they just blame TEPCO. TEPCO complain no budget. I don't see any urgency of national crisis. So they point the finger at each other. Intentionally they are doing. They are not uh, stupid. They know. <laughs> <laughs> they know. <laughs> mm. That's why I, I told to former Prime Minister Hatoyama, this is a matter of national crisis. Absolutely. You cannot depend on private sector. What can our Fairwinds listeners do? to help those affected by this tragic accident. This is a serious, sincere question, but very tough question to <laughs> answer. Only I like to say is, number one, you, Annie and Maggie, demonstrating a good example. You are doing for Japan and the rest of the world. And this sincere issue, attitude, very powerful in my country. Therefore, I like to suggest all other country, nation, at whatever level, high school, university, whatever level, they should also educate their leaders. This is the issue of human survival issue, not only now Fukushima issue. I completely agree that the uh, education, you know, educating oneself and educating each other, because including myself, I know, I did not know anything about radiation until the accident happened. And, um, but it's, it's not impossible to learn. And we, we have to learn because we are living with that today, where, you know, regardless of where we are. So the onus is on each of us to learn more about it. And then I think um, it's scary in a sense, and yet I think by learning, you know, you will probably see what the next step should be taken. It will come to. Yeah, it's uh, Kaneko-san, as I said, I worked 40 years <laughs> UN International. We never talk of uh, consequences of this disaster for 100,000 100, years pattern. This is open eyes. This is, I didn't know anything about nuclear accident issue until this accident happened. But I didn't realize we are taking responsible for 100,000 years for our descendant. We cannot escape from the fact already. You know, when you turn a nuclear power plant on, there is no off switch. Mm. The, um, the heat remains for 10 years, and the radiation remains for 100,000 years. So you can't change your mind. Throwing that switch on is a 100,000-year commitment. There is no off switch with nuclear power. So in another word, we produce the car without automobile car, without the brake. <laughs> Many scientists say, I kill. We learn from mistake. Yes, it is true. Science technology developed from mistake. But I learned nuclear accident is different. For 100 years, you cannot learn from mistake. It's too late to our descendant. In closing, we would like to thank our guests for being here today and for lending their voice to this incredibly important issue. 
Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you very much for having us. This has been a wonderful opportunity for the listeners of the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast to better understand the continuing struggles with the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Thank you for tuning in this evening. My name is Nathaniel White-Joyle, and this has been a Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast. <laughs>